Part 1. You will hear a conversation between a customer service representative and a customer who demands a full refund. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 4. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 4. Hello and welcome to Under Pressure Enterprises Customer Service Department. This is Kelly. How may I help you? Yes, I'm calling about one of your rice cookers I just purchased. What seems to be the problem, sir? Seems? There's no seeming about it. The blasted thing shoots hot steam all over the place, that's what. It nearly scalded my hand when I went to open it. Why, it could have killed the cat or something. It could have exploded and killed my wife and me. Sir, sir, please calm down. As long as the steam escapes the cooker, it won't explode. So you're telling me there's no problem? Are you calling me a liar? Sir, no one is calling you a liar. Yes, so I demand a full refund. Under pressure, we'll be happy to refund your money, sir. Now, I just need some basic information. Okay, okay. Sorry, I do tend to get a little hot under the collar. My wife tells me to slow down. So, what do you need to know? Sir, don't worry. I just need to ask you the model number of the cooker. Hmm. Where are my glasses? Ah, here. Let's see. Ah, it's R242. R242. Okay. And how much did you pay for the product? £89.99. It was on sale. I guess I should tell you. Thank you. That's honest of you. Now, where did you buy the cooker? Which store and which branch? At that big electric life appliance store downtown. The city centre branch? That's the one. And you say the problem is that the steam escapes? Yes, it does. No problem, sir. If there's steam escaping, clearly the cooker is broken or defective. So we have an R242 cooker with an escaping steam problem. It was bought from Electric Life City Centre branch for 89.99. Is that correct? Yes, that is correct. Oh, I nearly forgot. When did you buy the cooker? Just as soon as my wife got the crazy idea, she'll live longer if she stops eating good English food, roast beef and mash. No, all she says she wants is rice and vegetables and sauces you'd not soak your feet in. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 5 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 5 to 10. Sir, sir, when did you buy it? Oh, there I go again. Let's see. We bought it just six months ago. We hardly use it either. But six months? Is that too long? I mean, for the warranty? Very well. That's well within the warranty period. Now, what's your name and address? Name and address? What for? Sir, it is company policy. If you want your money, you must inform me. Money, you say? Oh, my name is Herbert Hewitt, and my address is 84 Park Road. Is that here in Coventry? Yes. The postal code is B0241DJ. But I don't think sending things in the mail is very secure or very efficient. I mean... Don't worry, Mr. Hewitt, don't worry. We can credit the money to your credit card. You do have one, don't you? Yes, that's how we paid for the cooker. Oh, yes. We still have the number on the computer. I only need to ask your card's expiry date. I'm afraid I never give that sort of information out. I mean, once you have that, anyone could go charging things and... Sir, 
I said your expiry date, not your card's password. Oh, uh, yes. Foolish me. Of course, you didn't say password. Let's see. That will be April 2008. April 2008. Very well. Your card still has nearly two months left to go. We'll get that refund right to you, probably by five o'clock this evening. You had better. If I don't get my money... Wait, wait. Yes, I know I'm losing my temper again. I really am sorry. I haven't had my medicine today. And, sir, just one more question for our records. How often do you go shopping at the city centre branch? Oh, well, it's hard to say. I suppose maybe once a month. But I can tell you this. If I don't get my refund, I'll never shop there again. Oh, I think it's time to start looking for another job. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a man talking about areas for growing vegetables in towns called allotments. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 17. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 17. Good evening, everyone. I'm delighted to see so many of you. I was going to start by saying that more and more people are seeing the value of growing their own fruit and vegetables, but now I don't need to. First of all, let me say that whether you have a garden or not, there are all sorts of benefits to having a plot of land you can call your own, and it will give you a great sense of satisfaction. OK, let's assume you have a garden. Chances are it's small. Most gardens in cities are hardly big enough for a few pots of herbs and a couple of rows of beans. Now that's where allotments come in. A typical plot is around 250 square metres, big enough to feed the family for a year, big enough, too, to grow a whole range of vegetables, fruit as well, perhaps, not just cabbages and potatoes. Moving on to the social aspects of an allotment. How many people can say their garden is a meeting place? You might chat with your next-door neighbour every now and again, but allotments are notorious communal hives. There are usually between 10 and 30 plots on any allotment site, and they bring together people from all sorts of social backgrounds. Where else do you find a lawyer deep in conversation with a lorry driver? There's often a great sense of camaraderie, with initiatives to involve the wider community, including the less able, the retired, and the unemployed. In urban areas nowadays, people may have a tiny yard or a balcony, but it's not a garden. An allotment is a huge recreational asset for anyone in that situation. First of all, there's the exercise. Renting an allotment costs around £30 a month, 
That's generally a lot cheaper than joining a gym. Then there's the involvement with nature. Watching seeds grow into mature plants gives so much pleasure and such a sense of achievement. Spending time outside in the fresh air boosts our mental as well as physical well-being. And one more thing. Don't forget allotments are also an enormous benefit to the environment. They provide invaluable green space in our ever more clogged up towns and cities, making them more sustainable and appealing to live in. These spaces provide a habitat for wild plants, birds, insects and occasionally bigger animals. What's more, locally grown food doesn't have to be transported long distances and that helps to reduce road traffic and hence pollution. Now, food, a subject we all like talking about, because the main appeal of an allotment is obviously taking home all the freshly picked vegetables and fruit. So why is Grow Your Own so good? Well, to start with, there's the superior flavour. Food you've grown yourself tastes infinitely better than anything bought in a supermarket because it will be super fresh. Another point in its favour is the range. These days, gardeners are growing an amazing variety of vegetables on their allotments. Finally, there's the bonus of knowing that the produce you've grown is organic. You know that what you're eating wasn't grown on an industrial-scale farm or sprayed with large amounts of pesticides. Now you have some time to look at questions 18 to 20. Now listen to the next part of the talk and answer questions 18 to 20. Now I'm going to show you a typical allotment from the site closest to here on Finlay Road. Let me just get this image up. That's it. Can everyone see? So, as you can see here, each plot has a fence around it and its own gate. Between the beds are grass walkways. That means you can walk in and around comfortably and not get your boots too muddy. There are soil beds on either side. This plot, in fact, has two smaller flower beds opposite a much larger area for vegetables. And there's also a glass house for growing tomatoes or anything that needs more warmth and protection. Here you can see one of those at the front near the gate. Most allotments have their own shed at the far end, as you can see. Allotments do need a water source, though and there are stone sinks outside the sheds. A hose pipe can be attached to the tap for easy watering. Some of the plots have a pond, though they're not always popular as they tend to attract insects. And this plot has a compost bin at the end opposite the shed for recycling organic waste. Right, so, how to go about getting an allotment? That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You'll hear a talk between an interviewer and an interviewee called Chris Evans from the Royal Caledonian Curling Club about ice curling. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Today, we're pleased to have on the show Chris Evans from the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. Now, let's welcome Chris to tell us something about ice curling. Chris, please. Thank you. It's my honour to briefly talk about ice curling here to all of you. So let's start with what curling is. Curling is a sport in which players slide stones on an ice rink towards a target area which is segmented into four concentric circles. Two curling teams consist of four players, the lead, the second, the third, and finally the skip. The captain of the curling team and its players will throw their stones in the order stated above. Each team has eight stones. The purpose is to accumulate the highest score in the game. Points are scored depending on which stone is resting closest to the center of the target area at the end of the game. The ice surface on which the game is played or the rink in curling is called the sheet. It is covered with tiny droplets of water that become ice and cause the stones to curl or deviate from a straight path. The curling players should slide the heavy polished stones or rocks across the ice curling sheets towards the house, a circular target marked on the ice, as I mentioned before. There are several pieces of equipment essential for a curling game, so a concise instruction will be given to you. The most important things are the curling brush, which is used to sweep the ice surface in the path of the stone, as well as the curling stone, which is sometimes called rock. The former is usually made of horsehair, and the latter is made of granite, mainly coming from Scotland. Curling shoes are similar to ordinary athletic shoes, except that the two shoes in a pair have dissimilar soles. The sole of the slider shoe, which is designed for the sliding foot, is typically made of Teflon, while the gripper shoe for the hack foot has a special layer of rubber applied to the sole. During the curling game, you may also find a stopwatch attached either to the player's clothing or the broom, which is used to time the stones over a fixed distance to calculate their speed. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. Now, a word about the development of curling clubs. Curling is thought to have been invented in medieval Scotland, and outdoor curling was very popular in Scotland between the 16th and 19th centuries, as the climates provided good ice conditions every winter. Kilsyth Curling Club is renowned as the first club in the world having been formally constituted in 1716 and widely influencing ice curling development. In Kilsyth today, both men's and ladies sections are thriving, participating in all major competitions and having won championships in the British Open in the past. The mother club of curling, Grand Caledonian Curling Club, was instituted in 1838 for the purpose not as such to attract people's interest, but to regulate the ancient Scottish game of curling by general laws. With these official rules, the young curlers could be trained in a more professional way. By 1842, the new national club had sought to obtain royal patronage, and it has ever since been known as the Royal Caledonian Curling Club. However, many sports, such as athletics and tennis, were frowned upon as being too recreational and not practical enough. So the Crown banned them by law during the 1300s in the hope that men would instead practice the archery skills that were seen as vital to the country's defence. And the ban was lifted in the 17th century. So, do you know the reason for curling being kept during the 16th century? Is it because it was so popular or because people from all ages like children could play it? The spirit of curling dictates that one never cheers mistakes, misses or gaffes by one's opponent. And most importantly, all the team members should strictly follow the instructions of their captain, which is essential for men in battle. Curling was brought to Canada from Scotland and some curling was played informally before 1800. Curlers often used 
iron curling stones made from melted materials such as cannonballs rather than granite until the early 1900s because there were transport problems importing granite stones from Scotland. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a talk given by a lecturer in the art history department. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. In this lecture today, I'm going to introduce you to an American painter, Charles Wilson Peale. You may be familiar with his portraits, but did you know that he never even saw a painting till he was a grown man? He was born in Maryland in 1741. His father died when he was nine, and the family struggled financially for the next few years, and Charles became a saddle-maker's apprentice. One day, he went to Norfolk for supplies, and there he saw paintings for the first time. He thought they were so bad that he felt sure he could do better, so he decided to make painting his career. In 1766, he went to London to study painting with Benjamin West. Whilst there, he painted this portrait in 1768, see slide 1, Pitt as a Roman senator. Notice how elaborately symbolical this portrait is. The symbolism arises, of course, from Pitt's famous speech to the British Parliament, where he draws an analogy between the ancient Roman Senate's view of a barbaric Britain and the prevailing European view of the time of a barbaric African continent fueling the slavery trade. Perhaps you didn't know that the Romans used Britons as slaves. But I digress. Back to Peel. He returned to America and in 1772 painted the first ever portrait of George Washington. See slide 2. In 1773 he painted a group portrait of himself, his wife, mother, brothers, sister, his old nurse, and an unidentified baby. Just look at the slide. This painting is simply called The Peel Family. And you can almost feel the exuberance of the family and their warmth towards one another. He enjoyed great success as a portraitist prior to the Revolution, and served with distinction in the Revolution. During this time, he became friends with George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, and Thomas Jefferson. After the war, he continued to paint, and, when his wife died in the 1790s, as a result of her eleventh pregnancy, he remarried. He had seventeen children in all, naming the sons after famous painters or scientists. Although perhaps best known for his portraits of famous people, Peel liked novelty. Look at this slide of his two sons, Raphael and Titian, life-size, climbing a narrow stairway. This painting, The Staircase Group, 1795, was exhibited in a doorway as a trompe l'oeil, and it is said that it did, in fact, fool the eye of George Washington. Even as far back as 1772, we can see his desire for difference in Rachel weeping. 
It's a rather macabre portrait of his first wife crying over the death of one of their children, their daughter Margaret. I'd like to show you one more slide to demonstrate his innovative approach. This is a portrait of his brother, James, sitting at his desk at night, with only his face illuminated by a lamp. This was painted much later than the others, in 1822. You know, Peel believed anyone could learn to paint, and he taught painting to his brothers, sisters, sons, daughters, nephews, nieces, and other relatives. Four of his sons, Titian, Rubens, Rembrandt, and Raphael, became painters, as did his brother James. Before I finish, I'd like to tell you a bit more about Peel. He was active in politics for several years, and throughout his life he maintained a lively interest in many branches of science. He was also an inventor who gained patents for a fireplace, porcelain false teeth, and a new kind of wooden bridge. He collaborated with Thomas Jefferson on what was known as the polygraph, a kind of portable writing desk. But it wasn't any ordinary desk. This one could make several copies of a manuscript at once. He also wrote papers on a wide variety of subjects, from hygiene to engineering. Oh, and he also tried his hand at inventing a fairly primitive but innovative motion picture technique, new types of eyeglasses, and a velocipede which is a precursor to the bicycle. Now, some of the original velocipedes had pedals, and some didn't. You sort of scooted along on them using your feet. Unfortunately, I can't remember which type it was that Peel worked on. He's also remembered for his work as a naturalist. He established the first scientific museum in America and he even invented his own system of taxidermy. For those of you who aren't sure what taxidermy is, it's the art of preparing, stuffing, and presenting dead animals so that they appear lifelike. He was also well ahead of his time in that he placed his animals in a simulated natural environment. His most magnificent exhibit, however, was the complete skeleton of an extinct mammal known as a mastodon, which he helped excavate. The event was memorialized in his extraordinary painting, The Exhuming of the Mastodon. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.